Okay, Jet Vance, Darrell Revis. Is off the board. The New York Jets select Makai Beckton, Louisville. Can you fire up the New York Jets? Pressure just makes you go all the more. I kind of like pressure a little bit. The New York Jets select. Welcome to another edition of NFL Draft Preview with the Athletics, Dane Brugler. Dane, we're talking about the safeties on this episode. Maybe not the biggest Jets need, uh, but the Jets do have a lot of free agents. Right now, the only player on the Jets roster who we'll talk about later in the show is actually Ashton Davis at the safety position. So a lot to dive into. Marcus May is a free agent. Joe Douglas did say that re-signing him is going to be a priority but let's just dive into it. Let's start Let's start at the top of the class here. We're talking about TCU safety Trayvon. And then you have to help me with the last name because it is pronunciation season. It, Trayvon Merrig. Merrig. Uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of an A sound in there. Uh, it, yeah, he's a really interesting player uh, because he's a, he's got a cornerback and wide receiver background. And you absolutely see that on the field, uh, kind of playing that free safety role. Um, in that TCU defense, uh, a lot of range, a lot of versatility, uh, athletic ball hawk uh, that definitely fits uh, Merrick's tape. Uh, he, he's quick to trigger versus both the pass and the run. Needs to be a little bit better uh, just in terms of cleaning up some of the inconsistencies versus the run. But you know, he reminds me a lot of Jesse Bates when he's coming out of Wake Forest. Uh, you know, the, the Bengals drafted him in the, I believe the second round. Uh, somewhere on day two. And he's been a really quality uh, player uh, for the Bengals. You know, the tall, lean, uh, ball hawking type of player, the natural instincts, the feel when the ball is in the air. Uh, there, there's a lot to like about him. Uh, he's got a special teams background. He was uh, the TC special teams MVP uh, as a freshman. And then and when he worked himself into the starting lineup, uh, did nothing but uh, create ball disruption. Uh, 28 passes defended over his career, seven interceptions. Uh, he was the Jim Thorpe Award winner. So when you look at it, production, check, tape, check, accolades, check. Uh, Trevon Merrick's got a lot of what you're looking for uh, as that center fielder, free safety type of safety. And if he's your safety number one, how far back is Richie Grant as safety number two? Yeah, it's not a big, it's not a big gap. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer in Richie Grant. You know, he's a, he's an older player. He's going to be a 24 year old rookie. You know, your redshirt senior, where Merrick was, uh, you know, a true junior. And, and with Grant, uh, you know, you, he's another former wide receiver. But he actually, uh, you know, when he went to UCF, he was a wide receiver. Uh, they moved him to defensive back, and he's really flourished. Um, and he's gotten better year after year after year. He's fearless. Uh, he's not afraid to run the alleys. Uh, plays with thump. Uh, the the play energy, the range that he plays with is outstanding. Uh, consistently pops off the off the film. There's some just like Merrick. There are consistency issues there, but you see the eye discipline. You see the ball hawking tendencies. You see a guy with the range to make plays all over the field. He'll make plays deep. He'll make plays in the box. He'll chase down plays from behind. So, you know, he's another guy who can play single high. He can be your split safety. And I think he's going to compete for starting reps uh, as early as his rookie year and be a guy that's going to be productive. With Mayrig, you mentioned Jesse Bates. And I feel like Jesse Bates is probably one of the players that not a lot of fans across the NFL know a ton about. Uh, like they see his name, they see that he's one of the best safeties, but what makes him one of the best safeties? And you mentioned some of the carryover traits. Why is that such an important trait in terms of that Bates has and Merrick has that translates to the NFL? Well, obviously playing safety in today's NFL, there, there's so much asked of you. Uh, you have to be rangy. You have to be smart. Uh, if you take a false step, you're in trouble. Uh, so you either be better be an elite athlete where you can recover or you better be highly intelligent where, you know, you're not making those false steps, those false reads. So you're consistently in position. Uh, it, it's just, it's a tough position to play when you think about how offenses uh, in today's NFL, you know, four wide, uh, you know, these athletic tight ends in the slot, uh, yeah, safe, playing the safety position is not easy. And so if you can find a rangy guy with the instincts, with the ball awareness, uh, you know, you're going to be, uh, you know, viewed as, as a guy that's going to come in and contribute pretty quickly. And so I think Merrick fits that bill. Uh, they're, they're, again, he's he's a little bit of a lean player and, you know, needs to clean up some things in the run game. But I don't think he's a liability uh, as a run defender. And I think he could be a playmaker uh, versus the pass. Going off of that, do you think that there is a less clear-cut distinguish 
between a free safety and a strong safety, as you might have seen, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Now you think, do you think now that it's more, they have to be more similar than different, the two safety spots? Yeah, I mean, ideally, you're looking for interchangeable safeties. You know, you you want guys that can do both. They can come downhill, run the alley uh, with conviction, uh, thump in the box. Uh, but there's no question, there, there's going to be some players that are a little specialized at the safety position where you want them uh, in the box as maybe a nickel linebacker or a guy you want coming downhill. Uh, he's not as uh, productive or uh, reliable when he's asked to go in reverse or asked to turn uh, and put his back to the football. So, you know, playing safety position, it's hard to find those interchange, interchangeable guys. Uh, you know, there, there's a reason why I think safety is near the top of the list for a lot of teams in terms of needs every offseason. Uh, it's just hard to find these guys that are big enough where they can be reliable tacklers. Uh, they're not going to hurt you there, uh, but also uh, have enough athleticism where they can cover and, you know, they're going to be show up in pass coverage. So it's a it's a position that is highly coveted. But it, when you look at the safeties in the last few drafts, not many drafted in the first round. We didn't have any safeties drafted in the first round last year, and there's no guarantee we'll have one in the first round this year. Maybe Merrick gets in there. I think he's got a decent chance to be uh, somewhere in the bottom half of round one. But it's hard to find them. And so, uh, you know, I think that's why, you know, one of the reasons why when you have a guy that you you know feel like can come in and you know, play an important role, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be you know, really attractive players that a lot of teams are interested in. So that leads me to my next question, which you kind of touched on it. Merrig, if he's a maybe first round player, is Grant a middle of the second round player? I think he's a top 50 guy. I really do. Um, you know, play speed production, uh, you know, he's a, uh, a three-year starter uh, and he consistently created uh, turnover worthy plays. I think he had 17 of them over his career, 10 interceptions, seven forced fumbles. So you've got a guy that is, uh, you know, proven in that department in terms of creating turnovers. Uh, he led the team in tackles multiple times uh, and a guy that's been ascending uh, ever since he made that move to safety uh, we saw it throughout the season. And then you also saw at the Senior Bowl. Uh, Richie, uh, Richie Grant was outstanding at, at the Senior Bowl, played all over, consistently uh, was disruptive uh, with his timing, with his range. And so I, I, I just I find it very tough to believe he's going to fall out of the top 50 picks. And there's going to be a, plenty of teams drafting in that late one, early two uh, range that are going to look at this player and say, OK, he's an upgrade over what we currently have. It, it, we don't feel maybe as great about the options after him. Let's get him now. You mentioned his week at the senior bowl. He was the American team's top safety as voted on by the players that he went up against that Jim Nagy put together the rosters. And then of course he was one of the biggest risers on your article on the athletic mm -hmm. and for more of Dane's coverage of the NFL draft, be sure to check out the athletic the beast is probably is hoping to come out in a month. We're recording on March 1st. Oh. April 1st is, is the gold date, isn't it? Yeah, no, you just gave me a little bit of anxiety. I mean, it's <laughs> a, a, a month. Ho fire. Hopefully, okay. you know, hopefully a month from now, it'll be, uh, you know, uh, at least at the very least in the editor's hands uh, and, and pretty enough. soon going to the public. So, so if Mayrig and Grant are your top two safeties and mm -hmm. they're projected to be, where you projected them at the back half of the first and then in the beginning of the second, who are your next two safeties or who are some day two prospects that you think are the next couple guys to be hurt or to have their names called? Well, the next two guys for me uh, are really interesting because they're basically complete opposites of each other uh, in terms of their roles at the position. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's funny how you could have two players that are going to be labeled uh, as the same position, but be so different. Uh, just with uh, their skill sets and what they're asked to do. Javon Holland from Oregon, uh, he was more of a nickel safety in that Oregon defense. Uh, they usually ran, you know, five defensive backs, and he'd play a free safety nickel role. Um, his first two years, uh, his freshman, sophomore year, combined for nine interceptions. Um, he was the first uh, Oregon Duck to lead the team in interceptions in back-to-back years since Jarius Bird. Uh, you know, over, you know, probably 15 years ago. So, uh, you know, with, with Holland, and then he opted out this past year. So we haven't seen him uh, on the field uh, in, in over a year. Uh, 
Um, but this is a player that uh, you see the key and diagnose skills uh, from different alignments. And he can uh, impact the game in different ways uh, from uh, you know wherever he's asked to line up. Very disruptive. Uh, he's quick to read pass versus run. He's quick to react and attack. Uh, very loose, very athletic. Uh, there's some parts to his game he just needs to mature, uh, both coverage and, and run the fence, but highly competitive, natural ball skills. He could be that matchup defender. Uh, that teams are really looking for as, you know, we see a lot more nickel safety in today's game, guys that could be matchup defenders with tight ends and with uh, just matchup with the offenses they are doing. So he makes a lot of sense on day two. And then the the second one uh, who's very different than Holland, but a, a really talented player himself, Hamza Nasruddin, uh, safety out of Florida state who uh, was a wide receiver in high school. Uh, you know, he, he looks more like a linebacker. Um, I mean, he's huge. He's, well, I think he was 6'3", 213 um, at the Senior Bowl. So, uh, you know, he he was ready to bolt to the NFL after his junior year, tore his ACL uh, in the season finale of his junior year. So he comes back, missed the first seven games of this season. And so his 2020 tape is basically, uh, you know, it, it's just not a lot there to go off of. But I think he did enough in his first three seasons where we know what Nigel Dean is. Uh, he is, uh, you know, a, a guy that is physical, uh, he can uh, get off blocks with his his hand violence, his athleticism. Uh, he's fluid in coverage. Um, he's not a guy you want dropping into space and being you know that that single high uh, safety, but he does have some fluidity to him. He does have the ability to uh, find passing lanes. Um, the the coaches call him a war daddy at Florida State. So you know I think they uh, it just really comes down to positional fit and you know where are you going to use this player? Uh, he needs that defined role. But as long as you have it, he's super long. He's a downhill force player. I think he's going to be that hybrid box safety and a core special teamer for a long time. What does being a war daddy even mean? <laughs> uh, you know, that, that was a term that, you know, it goes back, uh, you know, I know Jimmy Johnson with the Cowboys would use that often. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it just means you're, you're being disruptive. You know, you, you bring a level of toughness to the team and that's something that, uh, you know, the, the coaches at Florida State routinely talked about, uh, how he's a little bit quiet off the field, but you get him in meeting rooms and you watch tape and he's the guy with his hand up answering questions. You get him on the practice field and, you know, he's making plays. Uh, he had over 500 snaps on special teams uh, in his career uh, for the Seminoles. So, you know, this is a guy that, uh, you know, brings it every day. He's coachable and, you know, he's got that football character that teams are looking for. All right, I dig the nickname and I dig the name. Hamza Nasruddin, pronunciation season, hand in hand with draft season. You know, real quickly on Javon Holland, you talked about Richie Grant and how important it was for you to see him live at the Senior Bowl. For someone like right. Holland who had such good production when he was at Oregon and then opted out, how difficult is that to project? And is that more even like, is he more of a question mark or do you think that teams have a good sense of what he brings to the table? You know, it's and it goes to the overall question with these opt outs. You know, we, we have to look at each one individually and, you know, what they put on film and just try to uh, understand, OK, the, over the last year, what have they been doing? Have they been getting better? Uh, you know, is their development stunted or have they been doing taking necessary steps to get better as a football player? And so, you know, with. And that's something, you know, without the combine this year, it, it's going to be tougher to answer. A, a lot is going to be on Javon Holland at his pro day to show out and, you know, look like a player that's been, you know, busting his tail over the last year. Even though he hasn't been on the football field, he's still been working towards that goal of being the best uh, defensive back that he could be. So, you know, it, it, it's tough. Uh, I think that each team's going to look at it a little bit differently just because we've never seen this before. And so naturally there's going to be some variance from team to team. But I think he did put enough on tape over his first two years that we have a good idea of what he is. And now it's just up to him to show during the workout phase of, of the process that, you know, he, he's been continuing that maturation and that development. And, you know, he's a even better player than the last time we saw him. I don't know if you even have an answer to this question, but let's say let's play hypothetical here. If Holland did play in 2020 and he had a similar year to what he did in 2019 or even a little bit better as you know, we're assuming that he got a little bit better. Would he still be in this conversation of day two, or do you think he could have potentially even been a top 50 player kind of like Richie Grant? 
I think he'd be competing with Richie Grant to be that number two um, safety. Uh, assuming that, uh, like you said, this past year as a junior, he took another step in his development. Uh, in August, my first top 50 board that I put out uh, over the summer before the 2020 season even happened, I think he was number 48, 47, something like that. So he was right there on the cusp of being a top 50 player. And if you're telling me that if he's developed and got better than what we saw on a sophomore film, then, yeah, I think he's in that mix to be, you know, the number two safety where and he might still be, you know, we, we just uh, it's a little more of a projection uh, just because we don't have any film of him from the 2020 season. Right. So I guess there's kind of two ways to look at it. You're either potentially if a team drafts Holland, you're either getting great value depending where you draft him or you're taking an, a little bit of a risk because you don't know what he was in 2020 and you're relying on his shorts and a t-shirt performance at a pro day. So I guess we'll see what happens. And then in terms of Nasrul Dean, we know that he has great size. You mentioned he weighed in at 6'3", 213 FSU. Their website has him at 6'4", 220. Being that tall and that big at that mm -hmm. position, how does that help Nasrul Dean in terms of his play and having that wide receiver background? It was, yeah, it's a great question because it's it's rare to have safeties that size, uh, you know, that, and that's why he's looked at as kind of that linebacker slash safety tweener, uh, a guy that's going to be best downhill, best in the box. Uh, but having that length always helps because, you know, your tackling radius is just a little bit longer, uh, you know, the ability to cast a wide net and get the ball carrier on the ground or uh, when you find those passing lanes uh, you're having a few extra inches uh, with your with your length to disrupt the passing lanes so I mean it's something that uh, is you know you'll always want bigger guys but at a, at a position like safety you know you you worry okay he's he's an oversized safety but is he can he still move like a safety is he still have that fluidity where he can collect his feet uh, flip his hips and, you know, be a reactive player. Uh, and I think he can. So, you know, even though he is best uh, as a downhill force player, as a box guy, he's not overly stiff. He's not a guy that, uh, you know, needs to be uh, at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he, he can be do a little bit of any, everything, but uh, you want him coming downhill. You probably want him more towards the box. And Nasrul Dean led FSU in tackles each of the past two seasons that he played. And, um, who are some day three players that you think deserve a little more attention? A uh, player for Indiana, uh, Jamar Johnson. Uh, he, he was a free safety there. Uh, you know, he did a little bit of everything for Indiana. Uh, you know, played the Husky position that they have, uh, a little strong safety, a little free safety. Um, you know, but when you, you know, studying Justin Fields for Ohio State uh, quarterback, uh, this is a player that uh, jumped off the page. Uh, he had a, an interception in that game. Uh, you know, led the team in interceptions with four this past season, only played eight games and had four interceptions. So um, every other game, you know, he was coming up with an interception. Uh, this is a player that he he's an instinctive pattern reader. So, you know, he, he understands route combinations. He understands what receivers are trying to do. And he does a nice job balancing his eyes between the pocket and, you know, watching the eyes of the quarterback and balancing with uh, with the routes and understanding where the receivers are going. So that's something that is a is definitely a skill that you're looking for at the safety position. And then you want a guy that can take advantage of those mistakes. And he absolutely has done that when you look at his ball production and uh, and, he, and what he's done. So uh, you wish he was maybe a little bit more physical um, uh, on a consistent basis. When he wants to get physical, he'll get physical. But he could be a little choosy as a tackler here and there. And so I uh, want to see him be more physical in terms of snap in, snap out, just be more consistent. Um, and if he does that, he could push for some starting reps in this league. Uh, and then another day three safety who's really intriguing in this class, Sean Davis uh, at Florida. A uh, little bit undersized, not the biggest guy, you know, five, ten and a half, uh, 200 pounds. But this guy's twitched up, and I think he's got the football IQ to make it at the NFL level. Um, he senses what's about to happen, and you know he does a nice job getting a head start. So uh, he, he needs to stay off the injury report. Now, it's one of the reasons why he's looked at as a day three pick. But again, he's a quick twitch athlete. The awareness, the urgency that he plays with, those are the type of qualities I'm looking for uh, at the position, especially when we get to day three. In terms of Johnson, you mentioned the Husky role. What exactly is the Husky role in that defense? Uh, you know, it's uh, the way they use it uh, and they, they mix and match. So they'll sometimes he'll be asked to be a slot corner. 
Sometimes they'll be asked to be more of a uh, split safety or single high safety. Other times he's he's creeping towards the box. So it's really a, a versatile role where he's going to be doing these different things. And I think that's that's what you want. You want a guy that has experience doing a lot of different things, whether it's lining up in man coverage against a slot receiver or you know playing from you know that single high perch where he has to see the entire field and really make quick decisions about you know where he's going to go. And I think he's shown that. So being able to play all over the field is something that uh, you know, even though he doesn't have a lot, of, he only has nine starts. Uh, you know, he started one game as a sophomore, and then all eight games this past year for Indiana. So he doesn't have a you know a, an extensive resume. But when he was on the field, he was asked to do a lot of different things, and I feel it feels like the coaches gave him more and more responsibility as he gained experience. I love it. And real quickly on Davis, Florida's had a pretty good uh, track record lately in terms of defensive backs to come out and play in the NFL and specifically safety. When you think of guys like Keanu Neal, Marcus may being one of them. Mm -hmm. So we'll obviously have our eyes on Davis, but let's move to some fan questions. Let's actually stick on the safeties here. Let's bring up the question. Michael wants to know where would Ashton Davis rank in this draft class as a safety? And how do you see him fitting into the new jets defense, which of course is coordinated by Jeff Ulbrich. And the head coach, Robert Sala, brings over that defense from San Francisco as well. Well, yeah, and, you know, we we talked about uh, uh, Davis a lot last year. We, I, you know, a guy that was easy to like. Um, if you were in this draft class, I think he'd probably be around the same range where he was last year. You know, the fourth or fifth safety uh, available somewhere top 75. Uh, you know, personally, I've got a higher grade on Merrig, Grant, and probably Holland uh, than Davis last year, but I, I really like Davis. I, I think he's, you know, we we talked about him last year. That fearless mentality, that track speed, uh, that that over aggressive nature will be a double edged sword, you know, and work against him at times. But you always take chances on uh, guys that are explosive, uh, the the competitive toughness that they offer. I'm really excited to see how he's going to fit because uh, I think he can, you know, he's more of an, uh, a safety. But he's got some cornerback experience, so you want to use him as that nickel safety. Like I, like I said before, we're seeing more and more teams implement that nickel safety, where you know you're getting the big physical guys on the field, but you know guys that can also cover. So I think he fits really well as that nickel safety. You know, it's interesting about the Jet safeties because when you're talking about perceived needs, and the Jet safety's not on the top of their list, but depending on how free agency shakes out and everything like that. The Jets right now, Ashton Davis is the only safety on their roster because Marcus May, expiring contract. Matthias Farley, Bennett Jackson, the two backups, expiring contract. So we'll see what happens, but safety is a position that does deserve attention. Let's actually take another fan question. Let's keep on the defense. Brad wants to know, what is the range to pick edge rushers and who fits the Jets defense best? Well, I mean, let's look at that 23rd pick uh, in the first round. You know, it's it's a really interesting spot for the Jets to to invest at, at the position. You know, you look at San Francisco's defense uh, under Sala. Uh, obviously, it all started up front. Stout, aggressive line. And it's, it, it's, a, it's fair to assume that he's going to want to build the same type of defense, starting with uh, the defensive line uh, with the Jets. And, you know, we feel pretty good about what the Jets have on the interior – but what can they do on the outside to uh, you know add guys that are going to be strong versus the run, but also give you that disruptive juice off the edge to uh, really affect what the quarterback and the offense is trying to do? Uh, I think when you look at uh, in that late first round, there are several options. Uh, you know that you know we'll talk about plenty throughout the throughout this process. Georgia's Aziz Ojulari is my favorite. Uh, explosive and instinctive off the edge. He's a little bit undersized. You know, he doesn't really, uh, you know, have the, the the size measurements that you're looking for. But, you know, neither did, you know, D Ford, who uh, Salah had uh, in San Francisco. So even though he is a little undersized, he doesn't play that way. Uh, strong hands. He can set a hard edge. Uh, just a really explosive player. So Audra Larry is a guy that I would I would jump at the chance to have him on that defense. Uh, Michigan's Quiddy Pay, I think he also fits. Uh, that rare lower body twitch. He's got strong hands. He can win the point of attack. Uh, so he's going to be equally effective versus the pass and the run. And then you know, both of Miami's pass rushers, Gregory Rousseau, uh, a high risk, high reward type of type of prospect, long, athletic, still figuring out how to how to rush the passer. Uh, but you know he, the upside is is phenomenal. And then Jalen Phillips, more of a technically sound pass rusher, uh, a little more disruptive. 
but you know the off field, the medicals both need to be considered. Uh, you know, teams need to do their homework there to figure out where he belongs in this draft. So you know, we're talking about uh, the twenty third pick in the first round. Obviously, you know, guys aren't going to be there without uh, you know having a few holes. But I think there's several high upside rushers that are going to be available, worthy of the conversation. And do you think that there's a chance one or two of those guys will be off the board by twenty three of the guys you just mentioned? Definitely. I mean, pass rusher is one of the most coveted positions in, in the league. Um, you know, I, I think all 32 teams could use more pass rush help. So, you know, I don't think it'd be surprising if, uh, you know, two, three of those guys are off the board already. Um, you know, I, we might not have one drafted in uh, the top 10, maybe in the top 15, but in the second half uh, of the first round, that's where I think we're going to see these pass rushers fly off the board, uh, maybe as many as five or even six of them. All right, well, let's wrap up fan questions. Let's go to the offensive side of the ball. Dan wants to know, if you're able to sign a wide receiver in free agency, meaning the Jets, would it make sense to go with Kyle Pitts in the draft over the other receiver options, such as Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, et cetera? And I believe when he says et cetera, Dan is referring to Devontae Smith, which is, I don't know how, how Devontae Smith would take being lumped into the et cetera <laughs> bit. But right. the question still remains, if the Jets were able to sign a receiver, would you, would you, Dane, go for Kyle Pitts before going for one of the receivers listed? Well, yeah, and regardless of who's at quarterback, obviously the Jets need to add more firepower on offense. Um, and Pitts is arguably the best playmaker in this entire draft. So, you know, let's, um, you know, for hypothetical sake, you know, with this question, let's say the Jets decide not to draft a quarterback at number two. Instead, they draft back, they trade back to like say number six or eight. And let's say that Pitts and Chase are both available. Assuming we signed a weapon at receiver and free agency that we feel really good about as being a starter and a you know a, a producer for us, I I'd go Pitts uh, because I think the overall impact would be something that uh, is exactly what I'm looking for on this offense. And you know what. I, I can already hear the, you know, the, the responses saying, well, when's the last time a tight end was drafted top 10 and, you know, lived up to that. Uh, my counter would be, when's the last time we saw a tight end that looked like Kyle Pitts? I mean, he's just different in terms of the role, in terms of, um, you know, how are, our teams are going to use him. I mean, just look at uh, the Chiefs with Travis Kelsey or the Raiders with Darren Waller. Uh, those two tight ends dictate coverage and affects how defenses attack you, which helps open up things for the rest of your offense. Uh, as well as, you know, the tight ends being producers. Uh, then the, I think the other factor to consider is uh, the the volume of wide receiver talent in this class. I feel really good about landing a talented player in round two, three, or four at receiver, not on the same level as Jamar Chase, obviously, but still a quality player is going to push for starting reps. So, you know, it seems uh, unlikely probably that the Jets are going to find themselves in a position where they're going to have to choose between Pitts or Chase, in the first round, but I would feel entirely comfortable going with Pitts in that scenario. All right. I think a lot of Jets fans would be very excited if they were on the clock and both Kyle Pitts and Jamar Chase were available. So no. we still have... it, it comes down to ice cream. I mean, what, do you want, you know, cookies and cream? You want mint chocolate chip? I mean, it's still <laughs> ice cream, you know, it's well, still good. I like, I like both of the flavors you just listed. There you so. go. So I, it just depends on my mood on that day. So that's probably not a great answer in terms of the draft. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we still have a couple months to for different chips to fall where they may land. So with that being said, that's it for the fan questions. But I'm going to throw in my own question because it's March 1st. We're supposed to be in Indianapolis right now enjoying a nice steak and shrimp cocktail from St. Elmo. And that's not the case. You're in Ohio. I'm in New York. We're both recording from our home studios. So with that being said, if we were in Indianapolis, who would be some guys that you think would test extremely well, blow the doors off the gym, and we would be talking about these players as potential risers because of their performances? Definitely a few names come to mind. Um, the first one's Anthony Schwartz uh, from Auburn, uh, receiver. This guy was a nationally ranked sprinter in high school, uh, competed internationally, uh, his hundred meter, like anything in anything under 11, uh, seconds in the hundred meters is, you know, really, really good. Uh, he won the, the state championship in Florida in the hundred meters with a 10 Oh seven. 
uh, which is just ridiculous. Uh, so th- this guy can fly. Uh, it would have been great to see if, you know, he, he would have got in the four twos at the combine. Uh, Quiddy Pay, who I mentioned uh, when we talked about the pass rushers, he was Bruce Feldman's, uh, 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 you know, Bruce Feldman with the Athletic does his freaks list uh, every offseason. He came in at number one on the freaks list. Uh, and and the, the, the biggest uh, reason was his three cone with a six three seven three cone at 270 pounds. I have a hard time believing that he's going to run a six three seven. Uh, I mean, just to put that in perspective, uh, you know, the best pass rush, uh, best uh, three cone from a pass rusher in recent memory uh, it was Von Miller, and he was like a six seven. So you're telling me uh, Quiddy Pay at uh, two hundred and seventy pounds going to get a six three seven? I even if it's close to that, even if it's six five or six six, that's a remarkable time. So I, I you know wish we could have seen that. Uh, and then uh, a pair of corners out of Georgia, Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell, both were 100 meter champions uh, in high school. Would have been great to see uh, both of these guys uh, run. They're both over six foot. Uh, you know, they both have outstanding speed, and that's why we're being, we're talking about them as uh, possible top 50 guys. So uh, a lot of speed at that position, and Stokes and Campbell, uh, two of the fastest. So between Schwartz and the two Georgia corners. Who's taking the cake and who's taking who's taking the crown in the forty yard dash? In your opinion? Oh, I mean, it has to be Schwartz. Uh, I mean, this is a, a he. He also competed in track at Auburn, so he ran track uh, at college level. Uh, he ran track at the high school level, and like I said, he 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 won internationally. Uh, that's a, the type of level we're talking about him as a sprinter. So forty yard dash, and, and we have to remember too, part of the forty yard dash is form and technique. And, you know, the guys, these guys have a lot of time to prepare for it um, or, you know, a couple months to prepare for it. But the guys have been running track their entire lives. Um, You know, they have a little bit of a leg up. And a guy like Schwartz, who um, has competed at a high level in track for such a long time, it had been, you know, natural for him to, you know, put his hands on the ground and burst out of a stance and then finish. So I think he really would have come close um, to hitting, you know, that, that John Ross mark, you know, the... And the, the close to the four ones, the four twos, Schwartz probably would have came close. You know, I, that was going to be my next question. And you mentioned the track speed. Well, Javelin Gidry, the Jets corner, ran the second fastest 40 last year. You told us about him. You warned us about him. Yeah. And sure enough, he ends up in the green and white. He ran a four two nine, second best time at the combine. And before we wrap up this episode, what would be Dane Brugler's best drill at the combine? Oh, gosh. Uh, Wonderlick. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah the, the non-physical um it, no I, I was, I, yeah exactly well yeah, i don't know maybe not uh <laughs> I, you know, I always said it'd be fun to do something like that just to um and i mean i i meant that more probably you know seven eight years ago but still it'd be fun to you know the, the guys that were critiquing and picking apart uh for having to go through these these drills you know it it's only fair that, you know, I have to do the same thing. So, you know, maybe one of these days, hopefully before uh, before I'm too old and too out of shape. I wonder if Rich Eisen is going to run the 40. He has to run the 40 yeah. somewhere, right? Uh, you would think. I mean, it's it's become such a monster in terms of the the the, the charity part of it that no doubt. Y- you have to believe, yeah, he's going to figure out a way. Maybe he'll pick, uh, you know, one of the high-profile pro days uh, or, you know, his oh. alma mater. He's a Michigan guy. True. So, you know, maybe we'll see him at Michigan's Pro Day start to do that. But, yeah, you, you would think somehow, some way he'll figure out to run the 40 this year. Yeah, I would assume. I, I, I was – I kind of had this vision that maybe he would just, you know, measure 40 yards on a nearby road, you know? Sure. Start to well, finish. Why not? Maybe, but really maybe make even... it pandemic central. Yeah, but, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, that, that is the appropriate way to close out this edition of NFL Draft Preview with the Athletics, Dane Brugler. Next week, we got a juicy episode. We're talking about the quarterbacks. Dane, thanks a lot. Stay safe. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, Ethan.